we have kind of a big problem now. And it has to do with the term serverless. Now, I am putting that in quotes right now because I don't even know what that word means anymore. And I don't think AWS does either. There's a lot of branding that's going on right now with a bunch of different service launches, a bunch of different enhancements that are coming to existing services, new services that are using this term serverless. But in my opinion, they aren't really serverless. And the cost that's associated with those brand new launches kind of speaks for itself. So let's dial this back a little bit and kind of talk about how this term serverless came to popularity. Where did it come from? And what do most people think, in my opinion, uh, when they are talking about or when they're using the term serverless? So I think most people would agree that serverless got popularized somewhere around the time AWS Lambda got launched. And for good reason, right? We used to rent servers from these different cloud providers, pay by the month. Uh, this new thing got launched. You don't need to pay for the servers. That's completely abstracted away from you, but it's a complete pay for what you use model. So if you use it a lot, then you're going to pay a lot. If you use it very little, you're going to pay close to zero. And they also have a very generous free tier. Awesome. Now, what I have a problem with is what AWS has been doing in recent years in terms of how they are labeling these new service launches and new service enhancements as serverless, when in fact, I don't think that they actually are serverless and they are just confusing everyone, especially because of, in some cases, the enormous costs that are associated with serverless versions of these different products that are going to blow your mind. And so I have a problem with this. Maybe it's in terms of kind of the terminology itself. Maybe it's in terms of how AWS is labeling and communicating some of these things. But I like to think when people talk about serverless, we mean scale down to zero and it's pay nothing when you're not using it. And when you're using it, it's a pay for what you use model, right? All right, so let's pick on a couple different AWS services so you can get an idea of what I'm talking about here. We're gonna start with Aurora. So we're gonna go from least bad to most bad, believe it or not. So we're gonna start with Aurora here. And I think Aurora is a little bit of a special case because the Aurora serverless kind of product history uh, with V1, which I don't even think you can launch a new server under V1 anymore, but that did support scale down to zero behavior. And when you were not using it, you paid absolutely zero besides the storage. Storage is fine. Not complaining about paying for storage when you're not using it. That's completely expected. But the compute I do have a problem with. So with V1 went down to zero, paid nothing. Awesome. V2, not anymore. They completely changed that model. So they use these things called Aurora capacity units or ACUs. It's basically like the hardware um, or the memory or the different kind of characteristics of the compute node that you're using behind the scenes, your AWS is using behind the scenes. Now with Aurora serverless V2, the minimum that you can provision is 0.5 Aurora capacity units. And Aurora capacity units cost $44.43 per month in US East one. That is the minimum cost. So even when you are not using this database at all, that's the minimum that you have to pay. That is not serverless. Let's go to the next one. We're gonna talk about Redshift serverless now. Redshift, data engineering, BI, analytics, all those kinds of good things, awesome, right? It's really, really expensive, typically, if you're gonna use the provision mode, but I think most people were pretty excited when Redshift came about with the serverless variant. Let's look at this one. So I used the cost calculator for this. I plugged in the small workload. The least that you can select or the minimum you can select is eight Redshift processing units. And this is the same kind of idea with Aurora capacity units. You'll find that all the services do this. They have this like abstract term that represents uh, what, what the compute capacity is of the node that you're using behind the scenes. Anyways, each RPU is about 16 gigabytes of memory. Okay, fine. And this is with one hour of daily runtime. This is what the, the cost estimate is, right? So eight RPUs, one hour of daily runtime. Total cost, $87.84. That's kind of a lot for when you're not using it. If you were to do two hours, that literally gets multiplied by two. It's like $190. Now, similarly, you can't set this to zero, right? There's no zero daily runtime, right? Maybe you have a pattern where, you know, you only do your reports on Fridays or something. Doesn't matter, too bad. Still gotta pay for that one hour. So it's gonna be about 87 bucks a month. Not too good. Now, that's not even the worst part. The worst one this is the granddaddy of them all in terms of worst cost model that exists today on serverless services in AWS. And it is AWS OpenSearch. They take the cake. So 
How much does this thing cost? So the minimum that you can specify is two indexing open search capacity units and two search and query open search capacity units. So there's kind of four nodes that you're using behind the scenes here. Total cost, and you're gonna laugh because this one is ridiculous, $700.82 per month for the serverless version of open search. Absolutely mind boggling. So as you can see here, there's a little bit of a problem with the terminology, right? Like they're calling it serverless. What most people think are serverless, you know, it's not this. We think scales down to zero when you're not using it, pay for what you use, blah, 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 blah. The problem is AWS keeps on tacking on this term and all these new announcements that are coming out, serverless versions, awesome, but they do have a minimum cost that you need to spend per month. I do have a problem with this and I think that there should be some kind of terminology change, at least from AWS's side, to make this a little bit more clear. I don't think these services that can't scale down to zero should be called serverless. I think they should be called managed capacity. Much more reasonable in my mind. Like you're not managing the units of hardware anymore. You're just kind of setting some abstract numbers and letting it do its thing. I think that's a much more reasonable term here that will align people's understanding of the pricing model with what you actually get. And so this has kind of been a rant video, but I'm eager to hear about what other people think about this term serverless and what AWS has been doing with it in the past couple of years. So thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.